welcome to um, session six of the ASC 2020 Global Conversation. It's a new day and we'll have another five sessions today and another two sessions of the Cybernetic Society. So it's going to be um, intense and hopefully very enriching for everybody. This session has quite a number of um, well, presenters assembled. Um, the reason for this is that three of them are co-authors of the same paper, and I'm going to introduce them one by one. Um, the first of us is uh, Shannon Turnbull, um, and um, he comes in from Australia. Then we have Ricardo Barrera and Rafael Rodrigo de Cora and um, Immaculada Puebla Sanchez, um, all three co-authors and uh, from the Spanish system sciences. Um, and um, after that, we have Robert Johansson, uh, Paul Levy, Sukanta Majumdar from India, and uh, Jose Cabral Fijo from Brazil. So it's a very colorful meeting, but we have grouped everybody according to very um, oh, related concerns, I would say. I'm the moderator, I'm uh, Candy Hare, I'm also one of the organizers. So you will have seen uh, my name and Jocelyn's names all over the place already. So um, uh, you can voice complaints after the session, please. So please uh, use the... Um, chat window during our conversation, the panel conversation, the first 30 minutes, because uh, we will go through that and we will uh, filter out some, some questions um, that we will answer, same as yesterday in the second half of the meeting. So the format is exactly the same as yesterday. We will have, 20, um, we will have 30 minutes of panel discussion, moderated panel discussion. After that, uh, seven minutes of breakout rooms where you can um, briefly talk about the themes that have come up. And after that, um, please keep your questions and um, put them into the general chat that is visible to all. Um, and we will, for the remainder of the time, discuss mm -hmm. your questions. So thanks a lot. So the, the theme of this session is cybernetic systems and sustainability. I feel that um, all of you um, who, who we have grouped here in your presentations, which were actually quite, quite interesting and very well done, uh, you have concerns that all around, um, all run around, um, generally saying uh, a concern with how things are done at the moment. And many of you have ideas, sometimes uh, with great urgency, suggestions on how to change the world, how to, how to make the world better. But this is not really like the same as in the design sessions. It's not really so focused on specific objects, but in your case, it's really very often focused on the nature of communication or the nature of um, hierarchy. And I especially find this, um, this whole um, subject of hierarchy quite interesting. Would any of you want to comment? Yes, please. Um, my topic is that we've got to turn the hierarchies upside down, otherwise we're going to cook the planet. And I put in the chat session the view of D. Hawk, who has a upside down organization and upside down organizations are called those which are governed by the stakeholders for the stakeholders to provide benefits for them rather than to shareholders. So my message is that system scientists have the know-how how to design self-governing automobiles and space rockets and they've got to teach the leaders of the world how to reverse the power structure of society from the bottom up to manage the complexity of climate change. So that's my starting position. And it's urgent. <laughs> yeah, the, 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 let me say amen to that. The, uh, we're watching the collapse of Western civilization. And uh, 50 years ago, uh, uh, J. Wright Forrester uh, developed his World Three model which was the basis of limits to growth. And it had a very simple message that if we look at what the system is doing at the moment, we are going to destroy our environment. And we're gonna hit the wall sometime around 2025. Well, they may have been a bit optimistic because we appear to be hitting the wall right now. Um, so what is causing it? Well, one is population growth and curiously, yeah, yeah. we seem to have it under control. The, the, not we much. Expect, we expect population to peak in two years. What we do not have under control is economics. And uh, our world is governed by uh, international capitalist corporations and, uh, and the global free market. 
Now the goal as a cybernetic system, the goal of that system is exponential growth of consumption. So we have been exponentially growing consumption and essentially consuming our planet. Hmm. So you cannot exponentially grow consumption uh, without hitting a wall. Like, and we're at the point where we've been consuming the planet, destroying the planet, and now the planet is going to respond. I'm often say, you know, global warming is not the problem. We are the problem. Global warming is the solution. The environment is going to get rid of the problem, which is us. So we have to begin to dialogue with the uh, Robert, um, I just saw a comment from Sukanta, who is in India, where these problems are of immediate relevance. And um, he, or oh, maybe Sukanta, you, um, you can voice your observation immediately. So from, from the ground, uh, in your also very, very sustainability concern presentation, uh, what, what do you see as one of the key issues in sustainable, sustainable development? Uh, actually, if I, if I look at India, the situation is like that. Uh, here, if you talk specifically for, say, for example, the transport sector, uh, I have seen banks, the, uh, the private banks or government banks, they provide loan to buy products like uh, small car or bigger size car, whatever it is. And, and, and uh, people can easily buy that because they understand that if, you, if they can uh, pay the amount monthly basis, like uh, it is like EMI, it is called as EMI. So they can easily get a car to move here and there everywhere. Whereas uh, many governments, uh, I have seen from 1970s, 1980s, many governments started public system quite well, but organized system, they tried to uh, make a setup of uh, public system of transport sector. But in many, in many states in, in India, uh, government started it in, in late uh, 1990s or even late to after, after 2000. So what happened? Ultimately, people already bought their vehicles and ultimately the public system doesn't work properly because their population, the, the demand or the, 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 uh, the amount of uh, demand that is not there because people already have their own vehicle. So, uh, so probably government should have that kind of vision from early stage that helped, uh, that may help because now uh, people don't bother our public system because they have their money and they, they can afford to buy vehicle and use it. So this kind of situation is already coming in the, in the, in the scenario actually. So now thing is what kind of insight should government should have so that uh, this kind of problem may, they can solve in future or maybe in the near future actually. It is, it is very much urgent for us also actually in so India. So you would, you would say this is really um, something that concerns government and I think many of the presentations here are about structure, are about hierarchy and are about how governments uh, deal with um, structure and hierarchy. Are there observations from maybe those of you who haven't spoken yet about what are appropriate structures and appropriate hierarchies that we need in order to um, maybe enter a sustainable development phase as, as best as we can. So where is the nature of change that we need to um, influence? Um, I want to draw a, a parallel between um, environmental issues and uh, specifically how government uh, affects that. I worked in the public transit industry here in the United States, mainly in, in the New York region, but also uh, nationally. <clears throat> and I can tell you that the same issues that create toxic conversations uh, uh, create toxic environments. And there's no difference between somebody monopolizing a conversation or somebody monopolizing a highway uh, in single occupancy vehicles. And in both cases, you need the power structure, the people that uh, are running things to create an environment where people can behave uh, correctly. Uh, here in the US in the 1980s, we started uh, employer subsidized public transit and it did move quite a, people, uh, quite a few people out of their cars and into public transit uh, in New York City and around the country. And it's quite measurable because you can see the shift as people move over. Um, and really all these systems in terms of structure, the structure has to enhance people behaving correctly uh, for the greater good. And if there is no structure, uh, as we've seen here in the US in the past three months, uh, you have absolute anarchy where people are just running crazy. Uh, and again, to me, it's no different whether it's a riot in the street or 
ridiculous traffic jams that cause uh, smog and pollution and global warming or social media that's out of control. To me, it's all the same process. And what they all have in common is a lack of structure that promotes good behavior. Thanks, thanks Paul. Uh, can I ask our three um, uh, Spanish systems authors? I, uh, I think your presentation was the most general one of all. And um, you, at the same time, you, pro you promise something that is very practical. On the other hand, you are concerned with very, very big issues. So um, can you maybe explain to us um, maybe this question of improving society, improving the way that we, we handle our development, our structures, if you want. Um, where are your suggestions for improvement and how would you go about implementing them? Okay, I'll take over and then Ricardo can probably uh, add something. Um, I think we, we, we are in a very uh, systemic problems and we, have, we need systemic solutions. And I think that we are all aware of it. So what we have uh, been trying to do is that when humanity really takes uh, um, thought about a, a big a project, they, the humanity does it, do it, they, they do it, you know? like the Apollo project or like the Genoma project or like the Brain project. And what we say in our uh, presentation is that uh, we are missing the environment project, which has to be taken as a whole from a holistic point of view. There are no uh, isolated or easy solutions. So what we propose uh, in our uh, um, quote uh, solutions is to form uh, 12 uh, issues that uh, should be solved together and holistically uh, because uh, they are uh, systemic issues and they, they cannot be isolated. So this is why we propose is not a problem of hierarchy, is not a problem of uh, getting things uh, isolated, but it's a holistic and systemic problem. And this is why we propose that uh, at least from the uh, Spanish Society of General Systems to act as a think tank and to invite everybody to participate, to have collective brains. So everybody that knows about a specific subject that should, uh, not, not in a small conversation like this, that we don't have time, but uh, it's open to everybody or to uh, people that know a specific uh, subject to try to do solutions in specific areas. We have uh, developed 12, uh, 12 areas because we think that this is more or less what the World Economic Forum and the other uh, organizations are, are doing already. And we are trying to see what uh, all the or this organization are doing and find a common terminology. And within that common terminology, we have proposed these 12 uh, issues that have to be solved by uh, collective brains, not uh, have uh, a, mm, some uh, easy solutions or easy uh, questions like uh, like we can do today. No? So, Rafael, um, would you support the solution that Lynn Ostrom's put forward and she got the Nobel Prize for? Pardon? Would you support the solution of solving wicked problems that the Nobel Prize was issued to Lynn Ostrom? Of course, as a solution. There are solutions from everybody. That's the idea. The idea is that uh, we we can have solutions and we can try to uh, to make uh, some sort of uh, uh, issues together, I think uh, being systemics and being uh, open-minded, we don't, we will not think that uh, our solution is the only one. But we can, can I ask you, do you see a better solution than what, what she proposes, which didn't involve hierarchies or markets? Because this is how pre-modern societies solved wicked problems in uh, without markets or hierarchies. So the question is, do you know of any better solution than hers? Well, uh, why we don't have a, we, we can have that one and the other ones in other specific areas, of course. Well, tell me about the others, please. It's getting well, there, isn't it? I don't have them now. <laughs> what I, what, I, what yeah. I am trying to do is open to the Spanish society uh, that people can uh, get there and uh, give solutions. I, I don't have them and I, I, I should, nobody should have uh, one solution. I think, I think, I think about mega taxation for the very I, rich. I uh, sorry, I, I want to interject here quickly because I see a communication that has two different aims. 
for some of you, you're interested in one specific structure, um, like a model or something, a, a process that can be followed, which would amount to some form of kind of practical instruction. Um, there's many others, however, who look at the nature of these proposals and the nature of these processes. So, for example, um, I get a very clear understanding that um, the, the very top-down oriented linear um, type of hierarchy is definitely not one that can address the problems that we're having and identifying and that um, we are looking for something that's more networked and especially we are looking at the relationship between communication structures or exchange structures and hierarchies so maybe that's a topic that some of you who have been a bit more more quiet so far um, can can pick up on yes please Jose I, um, well I think I mean I'm a very technical panel and uh, I can I think my my contribution here is kind of a soft and poetic, if I may, uh, because I think, I mean, my proposal is to, to play around with the idea of networks towards uh, lace works. Uh, it's a rather playful, but uh, I, I do believe it's uh, when, when Paul Levy talk about uh, Buberian dialogue, uh, I think we, we need to change the way we, we, we see uh, hierarchies and, and conversation and uh, when we see the way we are talking about it I think the terminology is quite important and uh, so when I propose it to, to, to change the way we talk it's, a, it's kind of a provocation but I think it helps uh, to, to change the way we see things uh, and uh, I mean the talk about networks today is so generalized uh, and I come up with this idea when I saw uh, that Bruno Latour talking about the COVID and he was saying, oh, the COVID has showed us that the, work, the world is networked now. And I said, well, my mother's saying the same. So the concept's not helping us. A brilliant guy like Bruno Latour is using the same concept or the same terminology as my mother. It's not helping us to understand the intricacies of uh, uh, hierarchies and the uh, dialogue and the possibilities of the variety within the dialogues and, uh, and the necessity of uh, uh, open spacing for the unspoken issues, I think. I don't know if that helps. Um, yes, Jose, maybe um, to add something more. You are arguing in your presentation, you're quoting Pask and you're saying that Pask already warned. He said that conversation is actually inhibited by too much communication. So he very clearly distinguished communication and conversation. And uh, yes. you are- Sorry, Sorry Candy. Yes. I, I hear all of you. And I, I was uh, impressed by the presentation of Paul about uh, Buberian dialogues. And I, I remember uh, many, many years ago when I, I read uh, the books of Martin Buber about uh, what is a man and, and uh, I and you and, and so on. And, and I, I think we need more dialogue and more conversations about how to work together, how to, to find solutions to the problems of our humanity. This is uh, the, um, the idea, the basic idea of our project with uh, Rafael and, and, and the other people. But uh, I, I think when we, we talk about capitalists or socialists or, or this government or the other or whatever, I, I think we need more, uh, more conversation, more, more lab and less corruption and more uh, think about long terms, not short terms, and so on. It's not depends of the systems, uh, of some political system. All political system can be uh, viables if they are with uh, virtues of, uh, in the governments and virtues of the citizens, because all together build the the society and this is a uh, one of the approach i think to uh, to need 
to 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 grow and and to go up and and to grow not to grow in the economic way to grow in the in the spiritual way. Yeah, uh, thank that's, you, Ricardo. That's the key. Yeah. One of the things I should apologize. Uh, uh, had I known the, the, the topic of the panel that I was going to be on, I would have had an entirely different presentation. So what I've done is at the very beginning of the chat, I put a number of links. One is to a presentation I did uh, last Saturday to the IFSS uh, precisely about this question of hierarchical structures and, uh, and, and dialogue and that sort of thing. And so that's on communication and decision making. Second thing is a link to my book. There are free downloads at, uh, at the publisher, www.bridgerpress.com. So you can see my whole take on the environment. It's called Green Rising, an alternative future. And the last one is the highly technical one, which is what is information. And so it presents the logical theory of information. Um, Robert, um, I would recommend that you also add that to your video presentation. So in the comment section, so that people who see your video also get that. So it survives um, beyond um, this exchange. Um, I would I would like to bring us back to this quite interesting theme of hierarchy and communication because many of you, uh, um, some of you are distinguishing be between conversation and communication and some of you um, don't. So some of you mean exchange and you use both terms inter interchangeably. So um, maybe um, that's something that we have to think about because simply because we have exchange doesn't mean it's a quality exchange. So um, I see some, some interesting um, questions here. For example, Jose is arg arguing for a very metaphorical lace work. We mean some connections may not need to be as strong as others and we may have islands and we may have um, we may have variety and discontinuity in such networks and this would be positive. Some others of you say that bottom-up nature um, is really important. Some others yet say um, we need to network everything. So, um, and then Paul Levy is actually saying um, if we network too much, uh, then we don't get a, a good exchange and technology is also not helping us to do that. It's true. I'd love to pick up on, on the lace analogy that Jose has. In fact, I took everybody's paper and in, in fact, using indirectly the lace analogy, I have put it into a mind map, which is on boober.bot. If you go to boober.bot and then there's a mind map section, uh, section I've taken uh, the essence of everybody's presentation that I felt uh, I can potentially absorb in, into my conversational uh, hierarchies, but actually uh, putting aside hierarchy and going to lace. So to me, the main concept of lace is that emptiness is okay. Uh, dead air in a conversation is okay. It means that people have hit a plateau in the conversation where they're not sure where to go and that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing. And in social media and broadcast media, that's viewed upon with horror. So you know, one of the first things they teach you in broadcasting is you can never have dead air. You don't want to turn on CNN or Fox News and there's a blank screen or no sound going on. But that's not real. There is dead air in the world. People do sleep. Things do stop. And when you have continuous dialogue, on Twitter and continuous dialogue on all these social media, that's what's led us down this horrific path that we've seen around the world and particularly here in the US. I'm in New York City uh, and it's just amazing how the clock has rolled back to the 1970s in terms of civil unrest and uh, just outright bad behavior in, in terms of how people are treating each other uh, both publicly and individually one-on-one. -on -one. The speed that people are driving has gone up. There's a couple studies that show that the average speed has gone up, but not just because the roads are emptier, but uh, it, it's all part of that same thing. So I think that lattice uh, concept is very important. The world is very complicated. Hierarchies are great just to get a rough skeleton structure and have a conversation with people, but reality is much more complicated than that. And lattice patterns are much more uh, realistic and beautiful than uh, structured contrived hierarchies that people try to uh, wedge themselves into. 
Um, I, I have a I have a question to, uh, regarding that because yes, I agree. It's more interesting and it introduces more local variety. Yet we also have um, a problem in our social networks where people get fed the news that they prefer, and we are not in a world anymore where everybody thinks the same thoughts or discusses the same things. But people uh, have their islands, and that is because of a certain level of disconnect. So how do we bring those two together? That's a, maybe a difficult one. If it doesn't generate any comments, then we can... I don't understand switch. the question. The, the question is, um, if networks need more variety, if we are suffering from constant connectivity, everybody is connected to everyone, uh, everybody around the clock, wouldn't we need more discontinuous networks, maybe more, more clusters that are maybe a bit more isolated from other clusters? Would that maybe give us a better pace and a better uh, ability to locally synchronize our thoughts? And then I said, at the same time, we are observing that um, we do have islands in our networks where people uh, get fed the news that they prefer to see. And as a result of that, um, we are less able to understand what other people are doing. Well, I, just, I think if you look at it, this, say, is, this is the two minute to go warning uh, with respect okay. to breakout okay. rooms. I, I'll give a 15 second answer. If you look at a trade show analogy, uh, trade shows and seminars have a lot of structure. People go into a room, they're given a presentation, but it's the hallway conversations that make it exciting. That's what makes the uh, process of uh, getting on a plane and traveling out to a seminar or trade show worth the time and effort. It's not just the presentations, which now you can get uh, uh, on the internet. It's what you get in the hallway between the presentations. And I think that's the whole lattice effect that, uh, uh, that Jose is referring to. There, there is no platform uh, right now available that provides that kind of serendipity. Uh, Facebook and Twitter, uh, all of Absolutely. them are very oriented towards self-created bubbles. So you that, get back to the problem that Christian is, uh, is pointing out. Yeah, Christian. Uh, yeah, yes, please, Jose. Yeah, I think one of the main problems, I think Heis von Forster has warned us, as Gordon Pask as well, uh, it's the triviality, it is the triviality uh, in the conversation, which is not actually conversation, it's just communication. And he says uh, this, the triviality between the, the people in, in the bubble, uh, that makes, uh, that people as a, as a very a, a model or, or a bubble that's very easy to manipulate. So I think the one point is it's not only to create a discontinu discontinuity, but also how to, to stop having so trivial relationship between people and or your friends and, and people connected in your bubble. So I think that's the main point. And the the algorithms actually are driving us into this kind of triviality as they feed us with what we need to, we, we think we need to see, we want to see. I think that's the main, main problem. And it's amazing how in the seventh was talking about that. I think Christian's asked a good question. How do you stop groupthink? And the answer is you've got networks that automatically generate contestability. And that's what Lynn Ostrom talked about, polycentric compound republics, where you have different groups that are subject to continual contestability by what Bucky Filler calls tensional integrity. You are getting challenges to everybody's views and, and self-correcting uh, challenges, which you don't get in hierarchies. And that's why you need networks, but you need very special networks to create um, uh, challenges. Thank you. So maybe this is a good point to start the, um, because there's a lot of questions in the room, lots of ideas. I see already the chat is very lively today. Uh, maybe we go to the breakout rooms now and uh, come back after seven minutes. Please, everybody, remember to keep your questions that you come up or comments, anything like that. And um, please post them into the general chat for everybody to see after you come back. So let's uh, get started now. Voice from God, please um, operate the chat rooms. I assume that we are all back to our um, from the back breakout rooms and we can continue our conversation. Is that correct? Yes. Um, okay. So we'll we'll pick up and um, I hope 
that you all uh, can now post uh, questions and comments uh, into the chat room so we can all see that not only your own uh, your own uh, chat room. So I'll, I'll, uh, while I'm waiting for a couple of comments, I'll start on the first few. Yes. Well, I suppose, uh, I don't know what happened in the other groups, uh, small groups, but in my group, uh, we are only two, 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 two people. <laughs> and, and we can uh, talk about uh, this, this, this meeting. <laughs> uh, in the other groups, they are more in uh, activity, uh, begin with other question, what will happen? So um, one, one thing um, that is um, coming up here um, very often is the, the quest question of um, hierarchy, how, how to structure hierarchy, how to, how to make sure um, systems are efficient and at the same time somehow manageable. And um, we also discussed in our group um, the idea of, you know, that the questions we, uh, we perceive are very often global, but they need to be addressed on a very local level. And there's a big divide between those because we can come up with general frameworks and we need to be able to, to communicate that at, at a government level. But um, there's a lot of problems that uh, come up at the local level. Um, all, all kinds of problems where local communities could also be involved. But to, to get those two together in a kind of a consistent uh, way, that is sometimes difficult, that um, local punctual solutions um, are not perceived as, um, you know, the same or almost in, incompatible with big systemic solutions. Anyway, um, please, um, from, from the panel, you can discuss um, questions that come up in your rooms, and I will try and see um, the new, newly posted questions. Um, to Candy. Tanta, yes. Candy, ah, Chan, yes. I'd I challenge you that you want a consistent way. I believe you need an inconsistent way to get challenges of what I call social tensegrity. And the story I, I tell in my video is that uh, is sporting organizations where sporting clubs within a region join together within a, their self-governing, self-regulating clubs, right? And they are federated at a regional state level to become self-governing and self-regulating. And they, they follow the law of subsidiarity that nothing is managed uh, at a high level that can be better managed at a local level. And so that's a way of designing networks that Lynn Austin was talking about. And in Australia, I federated the National Organization for Skiing, uh, which became, uh, the states would compete amongst each other, but they joined together and became federated as, as an example of polycentric republics, of self-governing republics, that they compete at the state level, but at the national level, they cooperated together. So you need both cooperation and competition. This is tensegrity, where you have this dual property, which is an invariant of behavior uh, of the universe. And then the national bodies become part of the self-governing international uh, federation of skiing. And that in itself is another self-governing body that becomes part of a whole on or holarchy of the Olympic Committee. And so what we need is this, these are networks which are created from the bottom up because only at the bottom do, are you an expert of what your local conditions are. You don't get consistency, you get inconsistency and variety which you should treasure rather than trying to manage out and value that so you can get challenge and self-correction all the way up to the top. And we need a whole global system of these holarchies. Holarchies are hierarchies of holons. Holons by definition have contrary and, and complementary contrary yin yang relationships and behavior, which is hardwired into our DNA. And the reason it's hardwired into our DNA is so we are born with the requisite variety of behavior patterns to learn how to survive birth and, and nurture until we can reproduce. And I'm just interested in anybody else that uses this concept of integrity, driving evolution and variety to, to drive self-regulation and self-governance. Is anybody into that aspect at all, please? Yeah, I, I wanna pick up on, on one key word that, that struck me and that's the word federated. And in my yeah. circles, I'm usually hearing the word federated in terms of federation of technology. And it occurred to me as you were speaking that you can't federate organizations unless you federate the technology that drives them. And probably the last big federation was the internet itself, 
being federated. That's a perfect example of technology being federated and controlled at different levels for the greater good. Uh, post World Wide Web in 1995, almost everything has become proprietary. Search engines are proprietary, social media that drives it are proprietary, many formats are proprietary, even when there's a lot of open source components with it, if you took the proprietary parts out, the whole thing would break. Uh, so it occurs to me that you've got to federate the technology and the control of that technology if you want the organizations themselves to federate or it worked pre-modern societies. Case studies were done in pre-modern societies. Australian Aborigines, the word federating is, may not be the right word. We, our language may not be able to describe exactly what the relationships were. It's a short, I use the word federate as a shorthand introduction to the idea, but it may not be appropriate to design those relationships which allowed Australian Aborigines to sustain themselves over 70,000 years without inbreeding right. And, and, and but also, com, which required, uh, they had 500 different languages, only about half a million people lived in Australia, and, mm -hmm. and they had 500 distinct languages, but they were associated and they avoid the wicked problems of overusing life-saving resources to deny them for everyone. And, and that's the sort of solution that I'm attracted to, to save uh, climate change. Yeah, I think the, feder the federated concept works very well on both levels, on, on the level that you're mm -hmm. talking about with people and organizations and in pre-modern societies. And I think it can work in a technical society, but with a lot greater challenge in opening it up to make it work. And those networks avoid the need to have markets or hierarchy. You don't need either. So you don't yeah. find markets in, in, in nature. Yeah. And, and if um, I they can just... I think I think you are in a very heated uh, exchange, which is great uh, in, in a productive sense. I want to bring in a couple more people in the audience, but pick up on something that you mentioned. Um, and the the idea is requisite variety and uh, requisite variety in exchanges. And I observed that, for example, Sukanta um, said in the chat, we prefer hierarchy just not to take responsibility. And that's very interesting because hierarchy um, always uh, has to do also with comfort. Um, and same with the requisite variety. We may not, um, stretching our variety may mean that it's not very comfortable and um, to isolate ourselves and to make communications more simple and uh, to um, bring less um, variety into them may be comfortable and we, um, we uh, prefer this compared to maybe conversations that are more interesting but may, may require us to stretch our minds. Uh, I think that's actually my translation of the concept of tensegrity because this tension, um, you know, it, it works in a structural way, it also works in a, in a kind of metaphorical way, same as Jose's um, uh, imagery with the lace work. Well, who, so uses ten yes. who uses tensegrity in a social context? Um, that's what I'd like to learn about. I, I, was, uh, I was given a reference where it was used in a physical sense in, in the last mm. meeting of the ASC uh, by uh, Martin Taylor. Interesting. But he, talked, but he only used it in a physical sense, not in a yeah. sociological sense. So you definitely use it in a metaphorical sense. And I think that's not, interesting. Not, a, not, a, not metaphorical. It's hardwired into our behavior. We can be competitive and cooperative. We can be opposite things at the same time in different times and different places. And the model of economics models of man that you're, you're one model or the other and not related to reality. Psychologists say that we have an interactive relationship with our environment and we change it and are changed by it. I don't think I don't need second order cybernetics to do that and neither do animals. So I think there's a lot of loose words used, which are, uh, are just intellectual games rather than learning how nature works and how we can save the planet. Uh, Sukanta, um, I want to come back to you because you have not been very, um, uh, very forward um, in your thoughts, but you always text in the chat window. Um, from your perspective, from India, what do you mean when you say responsibility? How can you get people to take on more responsibility? Uh, actually, what I have I have observed many times from my childhood, I'm watching my people in India. Uh, many times people uh, give responsibility to government. They say many things about government that the government is not doing this, that, that 
all these things but fine uh, sometimes they don't they themselves don't behave properly actually that is what i have observed uh, if if they they can use their education consciously and uh, and and uh, try to understand that if they can behave in a sustainable way probably it may help them to get, get a better option or better uh, suitable uh, situation actually so uh, in that case probably what i understand uh, probably education is one of the important thing which is very much is uh, required in this case actually uh, and it is it is not only edu education is not only for getting a job but education is also for to make yourself a good human being so that he, you can uh, make your surrounding society a better society actually that is very much required here what i have observed actually so these things are very much important very small thing but very much important thing actually thank you I guess that's not just um, your specific local context. Um, this can be stretched to much a much broader context. Yeah. The idea is responsibilities with government, but I have rights. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, the, and also, I have observed many times uh, that uh, uh, people are so busy with their uh, daily daily work, like office work or whatever it is. Uh, many times they don't like to uh, discuss about politics or all all these things uh, in common public or uh, like that they whatever the time they find probably they, they like to use it for the leisure purposes only so probably that is not correct sometimes they need to spare some time for the, all this political discussion so that they can have a better consciousness about the society also it is required actually thank you anyone from the panel wants to pick up on this conversation uh christian uh, uh okay i, I just want to Enriched the conversation with the a concept of uh, Willem Fuster, this philosopher. He, he 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 talks when he talks about responsibility. He he tries to to change the way we talk about it, and he says uh, responsibility is the ability to respond to the other. So it's uh, it's nice to see uh, responsibility as a, as a embedded in, in conversation. Uh, responsibility is how I respond to the other. So I think that helps in expanding this idea of uh, being responsible or being responsible within a system. So what does it mean about um, what you sign up when you are responsible? You must have more ability? First, you, you have to be open to the other. And uh, I think you engage uh, in, a, in, a, in a proper dialogue. And uh, I think that's the start. And uh, we, we change this idea of being, I'm responsible for such a person, for such a, a thing. But when I'm open to that, I think that now you engage and you, you are, I don't know, and you are just, uh, you pay for your, your, your difficulties. And uh, I mean, you're being responsible when you actually open and uh, you are open to listen. I, I, I just remember Glenville saying, our problem in a conversation is not actually to speak, but to, to learn how to listen and actually to have even hardware or computer networks that help us to listen instead of helping us to shout, to, to speak out. So I think that's a, one, one, one big question, uh, learn how to listen and, and to have structures uh, that help us doing that. Thank you. That probably translates also to the technologies that help us exchange, help us communicate as well. Um, the ability to listen, because normally we are all uh, trying to say more and um, not necessarily um, focusing on the exchange. I want, I want to, in the last few minutes of this panel, come back to a comment voiced uh, in the chat uh, a mile ago. <laughs> Uh, by Larry Richards, who says many of the comments seem to be directed to how we can tweak the current systems to solve problems. Why isn't there more attention being given to how we can create entirely new systems? This would seem to be where cybernetics could be useful. So um, can I put this question to the, uh, to the panel? Why are we not talking about entirely new systems? I, I agree with that completely. Uh, <laughs> starting from scratch is absolutely the way to go because to fix broken systems is a lot harder than to create 
uh, clean new systems from the very beginning, especially with today's technology. It's much easier to create something out of nothing. If you look at the major players in, in the social media market, most of them are still leveraging a lot of their old technology, even as they layer new technologies onto it. So in a way, they have more of a burden to sustain it than a new player does in creating it. And I think that new player needs to be a, a combination of not just a private entity, but a nonprofit entity working with government. It needs to be across the board type uh, uh, process. And probably, again, I'm not familiar with the underpinnings of uh, how the internet got created. I know, of course, you know, the, the general uh, process that it came out of US military and universities put together. But I think that beginnings of it where it had a, a multidisciplinary group in different sectors of the economy gave it the resiliency that it still has today. So it's funny, you understand system exactly in the technical sense. I think Larry meant it in the broader sense. Yes. So and, anyway, the, yeah. the other well, the, the other panelists, true. please. True, yeah, I mean, but I think you have to be able to simultaneously deal with both because they're both overwhelming realities. You can't make this, you can't control the system unless you understand how it works and the moving parts and what's in it. And the history has been that the players who understand the moving parts control the dialogue and control everything else. So if you want to control the uh, organizational aspects of a system, you have to first be at the controls of the nuts and bolts, uh, boring back end technical aspects of it uh, to earn a seat at the table of, of having uh, a voice in it. Yes, technology is one of the part and, and obviously it is required. You can, if you can make advancement in technology, obviously it, it will be helpful for us. But what about the other aspect of the, of the total social system, like so for example, the political part, the economical part, the behavior, behavior yeah. of the human being. Those are very much important because many times I have seen people get affected and they, they, they don't come out from their home. So that, 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 that technology doesn't help many times actually. They should create some, that kind of courage to come out and, and say whatever is required for them actually. So those parties also should be considered actually. In the Absolutely, case. yeah. I'd give it a 50-50 in, in terms of it, it's equally both people, organization, the humanistic aspects, and the other part, unfortunately, being the technical. I think that's just the reality that the technology really does overwhelm the other parts. Keeping them in balance is probably one of the, the hardest challenges that's out there now. Thank you. Do we get comments from some of our other panelists? Maybe another one or two things that you wanted to say, but you haven't said yet. Yeah, I was going to say before that uh, that's exactly why uh, we have to build this framework to build new systems. And this is probably why it's so abstract because we have to fill it in. <laughs> Once you propose an, an abstract system or solution, then people will immediately say, but what's the concrete example? Um, we've had that in many sessions here. Yeah. So. And, and when, once you have a concrete example, people will say, um, but what's the, what's the bigger system? This is all useless if you don't have a bigger system, I guess. Um, you have to have ideas for the new systems. Yeah. Andy, the other session is starting. That um, is great. And so that means I will have to wrap it up here. Thank you so much for all our panelists. Thank you all for being patient with the experience expansion of our comfort zones that it means to not just present our own papers but to engage with that which just happens during the session thanks a lot this was a Thank lot you. of fun and uh, can i encourage everybody to please uh, switch over to the other account where the next session on uh, cybernetics art and composition is going to start right now and i will be in there too so uh, thanks a lot and see Thank you in a minute thanks for the great moderation thank you levy thank you bye-bye Thank you, Sean. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.